if I'm a, a, a fan in Angli for uh, 84 now, I'm Sabah a fan of Roma can call Gary Mitty. We're going to get this done. Now, um, Jawar and Yadetta kindly invited me to say a few words about the refugee situation before we get on to the, the political part of this afternoon. Um, it is very easy to forget the situation back home in Oromia, and many of you will want to forget the situation back home. Many of you will be busy with your asylum problems in Great Britain and with making a life for yourselves as refugees in a foreign country. However, I want you to remember the problems back home and I want you to remember the problems you had as refugees in Africa. Over the last three years, I've been interviewing refugees in Kenya, Djibouti, Somaliland, South Africa, and Egypt. And I've interviewed 187. 51% of these, just over half, gave a history of being tortured. Is this too loud or...? It's not loud enough, so you want me closer to the microphone. Is that better? It scares me, this thing. Um, okay, out of 187 refugees that I interviewed, um, 94 had been tortured. Now this is over half, and this is higher than any other refugee population that has been surveyed. So Ethiopia tortures more people than almost any other country in the world. It is in the top division of torturers. 75% of people who've been detained in Ethiopia have been tortured. Nearly a third of the women that I interviewed had been raped. Over half of the women who had been in detention in Ethiopia were raped by members of the Ethiopian security forces, often multiply and many times. My 187 interviewees knew the names of friends, neighbors, and relatives who'd been killed, 342 of them. Now, if you imagine that the number of Oromo people in the diaspora is probably between 100,000 and a quarter of a million, if you imagine that number of 342 multiplied in relation to the number of refugees I interviewed, then that's an awfully big body count in Ethiopia. We should not forget about these abuses in Ethiopia. We should not stop telling people in the UK about these abuses in Ethiopia. Similarly, as I said before, we should not forget the problems faced that you had as refugees in other countries in Africa. Those of you who came straight to the UK were lucky. You will have heard about the the destitution and insecurity in refugee situations in surrounding countries in Africa, in Djibouti, Somaliland, Kenya, and Sudan, and in places further afield, South Africa, Egypt, and across the sea in Yemen and Saudi Arabia. There are tens of thousands of refugees in these countries. Many of the journeys to these countries have been horrific. People die in the deserts in Djibouti on their way to Yemen. People die in the sea on the way to Yemen. In Yemen, they are captured and tortured in torture camps, which have been reported by the BBC just a few months ago in July, where members of the military forces in Yemen will actually sell refugees to people in these torture camps who will torture them often to death 
Uh, there was one case of a paralyzed refugee shown by the BBC due to beating and torture. I've interviewed two young girls in Cairo in May. They were 15 and 13 when I interviewed them. They were 10 and 12 when they left Ethiopia because their parents had been killed. They fled through Sudan, this is as 10 and 12 year olds, with a woman who was helping look after the 10 year old. They were captured in a group of 35 by traffickers, Rashida tribespeople, who took them to the Sinai Desert. Those of the 35 that could pay thousands of dollars were allowed free. Those that could not were tortured and raped, including these two young girls. The woman that was with them was tortured to death. They themselves witnessed other people being killed, including four men who were killed so their kidneys could be harvested. When they arrived in Cairo in January of this year, they were very, very thin and very sick. They were covered in scars from where they had molten plastic dripped onto their bodies and where they'd been stabbed. And one of them had a scar from a petrol being poured on her left arm and then set fire. She also had scars on her ankle from shackles that she was wearing in the desert for two years before they were finally able to escape. I interviewed a young woman in South Africa who had been detained twice in Ethiopia for demonstrating against being taught in Amharic at school. She was whipped with a hippopotamus hide whip and her father had to pay large amounts of money to get her released. When she travelled to South Africa, it took her three months. She was arrested in Zambia for five weeks and shared a cell just five metres by five metres with 70 other refugees. I've been told of 15 people who were arrested in Zambia just for trying to get through as refugees to South Africa. These were arrested last July, I think it was. They've been sentenced to 15 years imprisonment in Zambia. When refugees reach their countries of refuge, thousands are warehoused in refugee camps. And we've seen people in refugee camps in Kenya, in Kakuma. Many of you here are from Kakuma and know what it's like. And Dadaab, we have had very few people who've been resettled from Dadaab, that huge refugee camp near the Somali border. It has over half a million refugees in it now larger than most cities in Africa and the largest refugee complex in the world. Where life is very hostile to refugees there. I spoke to a young lady, a Somali woman who'd grown up in the camp, who'd married an Oromo. They'd fell in love at the market and got married and she was banned from going back to the Somali community and her husband, they had two children by this stage, was accused of raping her by the Somali community and he's now in prison in Nairobi serving nine years for raping his wife. We know of many people who have been killed in Dadaab and in Nairobi because of the hostile situation from the host population and from other refugees. In Hargesa I interviewed families of people who'd been denied work and denied accommodation. The government in Somaliland said it was illegal to rent property to refugees and said it was illegal to employ them. So they had nowhere to go, no way of earning money. And there were over 400 of them camped in a social welfare centre which used to give them some aid. And on the other side of the road, in, in tents, which gave no protection from the rain or the cold. When they complained about this to the Minister of the Interior, they were gathered up and put in two trucks, taken away to prison, 
and after a couple of nights in prison they were sent back to the border with Ethiopia and it was only by luck that they were able to escape being uh, subject to refoulement back to Ethiopia. While I was there I spoke to families of individuals who'd been taken by Ethiopian security agents from Hargesa and from Djibouti city and taken back to Ethiopia where we know that they have been detained and tortured. And this carries on. The last episode was from Djibouti at the beginning of this year. One of the worst episodes is of course Tess Fahun Chimeda, who many of you will know was captured by the Kenyan anti-terrorist squad in Nairobi in 2007, having been a mandate refugee in Nairobi for two years. I spoke to a man who shared his accommodation with him, him and Mesfin Abebe. Mesfin and Tesfahun were, as you know, detained in Nairobi. They were interviewed by the anti-terrorist squad and passed as being able to be released. They were interviewed by the FBI and passed as being able to be released. But there was a woman in the Kenyan CID who was in the pay of the Ethiopian government and she allowed these two young men to be smuggled back to Ethiopia illegally as mandate refugees and then they disappeared in Ethiopia because they were held in underground cells at Casa Inches near Boli Airport for almost two years. At the end of 2008, they surfaced again in court charged with terrorist charges. I spoke on Tuesday to a lady who visited Tesfahun and Mesfin in Mayakalawi after they'd been there for two months and again horribly tortured. After five months in Mayakalawi they were transferred to Kaliti prison. There they were tortured for a while and then the torture stopped and visits were allowed. But again for two years the visits were stopped and they were again subject to torture. And then in August of this year Tess Verhoen had been visited by his sister for a few months at that stage, the visits had began again. And he was looking reasonably well, she said, apart from having his fingernail, toenails removed in torture and being very thin and very weak from beating. He was well enough on the Friday. On the Saturday, she went to visit and she was told he was in the hospital. When she got back home, other relatives had been telephoned to say that he had died in the hospital. We've been campaigning about Tess Verhoen with the British government because Britain supplies more aid to Ethiopia than it supplies to any other country in the world. I've been trying to persuade the British government that this is madness and that they are only investing in instability. We have had limited success. The British Embassy in Addis Ababa is following up the case of Tess Fahun. Mesfin Abebe, of course, remains at risk. Now, we are campaigning for the British government, the representatives in Addis Ababa, to visit Mesfin Abebe in detention so that he will not suffer the same fate as Tesfahun Chemeda. You are the lucky ones. You, Oromo in Britain, are fortunate. Most of you have shelter. Most of you have a reasonable standard of living. I urge you to campaign on behalf of the Oromo left in Oromia and I urge you to help with the refugees 
who are in not as fortunate a situation as you are. There are two things you can do at this very meeting. Lencher has copies of two documents. One is a template letter to your Member of Parliament. If you address this to your Member of Parliament and send it to him, it asks for him to communicate with Ministers, the Minister for Development and the Minister for Africa and also the Chairman of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Ethiopia, the MP Lawrence Robertson. It asks your MP to communicate with these people and ask them to put pressure on these ministers to think of ways that we can improve the situation in Ethiopia. Now, I would urge you to pick up copies of these letters and send them to your Member of Parliament. Even better, go and visit your Member of Parliament and hand him or her that letter. I urge you to take part in civil society in Great Britain. Join local amnesty groups, join your church groups, join your mosque groups, get your voices heard as a Romo. It is all very well in meetings like this. It is all very well in meetings like this, a Romo talking to a Romo. That will not get the pigs in, as we say in England. It won't have the effect that we want. You've got to speak to non aroma You've got to speak to members of civil societies in Britain. So join your local human rights groups, especially Amnesty. Join your church groups and join your mosque groups. And spread the word about the Oromo. The second thing you can do is help to support Oromo refugees. Now, Lencher also has copies of a standing order form which will instruct your bank to take a small amount on a regular basis, every month or every year, to the Aroma Relief Association. Already we are helping to educate secondary school girls in Nairobi. We want to expand this program and we want to enlarge the Aroma Relief Association's programs to help refugees in Kakuma camp again and also to help them in other countries in Africa. So these are two things you can do. Pick up the letter to your MP and pick up a standing order form to send money on a regular basis to the Aroma Relief Association. Thank you very much. Thank you.